in Manchester. Uh, the papers are, of course, fascinated still by um, Megan, the missing schoolgirl, now returned, and her school teacher. There's the Sunday Express, and there on the same story, The Sun on Sunday is going with exactly the same story. Got him, it says. Uh, and they've also got David Walliams talking about his battle with depression. We had Jack Straw talking about the same thing, you may remember, last week. Uh, what else have we got? The Independent on Sunday. Um, they've got an interview um, with Rachel Reeves, who's a, clearly a rising star uh, in the Labour firmament. She's in charge of public spending, and she's also just announced that she's pregnant, but she's not going to call the baby Ed. Uh, what else? Scotland on Sunday. Labour seeking more powers for Hollywood. Actually, an important story there um, as the parties um, start to kind of struggle over the question of Scottish independence and devolution. And what else? finally, let's have a look at the Sunday Telegraph. I think it's the third week running now. They're running a major old-fashioned newspaper campaign um, against what they say is misspending and waste and extravagance in Britain's aid campaign. And they're really plugging this. There's pages and pages inside about that as well. Anyway, to review the papers, as promised, Polly Toynbee, Matthew Parrish, thank you both very much. We're going to have to start with the politics, of course, being in Manchester, Labour conference, all that. Yes, Matthew. L let's go to uh, that photograph that uh, you mentioned. Uh, Ed Miliband and his wife Justine and their two children arriving at the conference. Like all party leader photographs, this one is very, very carefully set up. Ed Miliband looking very relaxed in a grey jumper and, uh, and, and brown moccasin-style shoes. Uh, the, 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 the couple looking very much the, the happy, relaxed family coming for a holiday rather than a conference. And this is because Ed's people want to rebut the idea that there's something a bit cold or pointy-headed yeah. about him. And indeed, people who know Ed Miliband recognise the Ed Miliband in this picture better than the cold, pointy-headed picture. Polly. But of course, Labour politicians are mostly very, very reluctant to do that. We've had an awful lot more of Cameron and kids, and everybody knows yes. what they look like. It's a kind of once-a-year gritted teeth thing for Labour politicians to do. I'm looking at the Observer, has a big interview with Ed Miliband today, um, Andrew Ronsley, Toby Helm. <clears throat> Andrew Ronsley here saying the big test is to make voters see him as Prime Minister, and I think that's pretty much the theme of all the papers. Can he shed some of that earnestness, wonkishness, and talk human, not use words like pre-distribution, which is a very good concept, but an appalling word, and um, will his authenticity Authenticity actually be more important perhaps than any lot of spin doctors doing what they did to Cameron. Well, if and perhaps, because I mean, I said earlier on that the opinion polls, his own personal ratings, weren't great. I was being quite kind. I mean, they're pretty terrible, aren't they? Yes, but uh, they very often are when people don't really know a leader. And it is true that he has a rather cool demeanour, but I think he has dignity mm. and he has stature. Andrew Rawnsley in that piece starts by saying that uh, when he was asked whether the country could see him as Prime Minister, he said that's for the country to say. Andrew quotes that as an example of his detachment and coldness, but no, I, I think that's a very dignified answer. You don't say, oh yes, I think the country can see me as Prime Minister. I, yeah. I, like, the, I like the stature like that, there is about him, the bearing. Yes. Everybody comments on how extraordinarily relaxed he is under fire. I think one thing is that his ratings have shot up. He hasn't quite hit, got, re reached Cameron. Cameron's have plunged down. So the Labour is hoping that at some point the lines cross, and who knows if they do or not. But they do point out that Cameron at this stage, before the last election, was seen as less prime ministerial than Gordon Brown. So it shows mm. how things can yes. change. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, helpful not intervention by Len McCluskey, uh, Matthew. Yes, um, yes. This trade is... Union, uh, uh, leader. And of course, 70% of Labour's money comes from the trade union. Uh, this is the front of the Sunday Times. Union boss will seize back Labour, General Secretary of Unite, which um, gives the Labour Party uh, huge sums of money. He has said in an interview in the paper, Unite would no longer fund MPs whose views were not in line with the union's aims. It's terribly important, uh, I think, if Ed Miliband is to make his peace uh, to woo the British electorate to deal with this question of, of, of the trade unions, whether or not they exercise an undue or a, a malign influence on the Labour Party, people think they do. 
And if Ed Miliband could do anything about that this week, I, I think he'd be surprised at what it did for his ratings. Mm. I think the very fact that he's given an interview to the Sunday Times is rather extraordinary for someone like Len McCluskey. Actually, it makes him seem extraordinarily irrelevant to the sorts of discussions that are going on in Labour at the moment. Uh, it makes You've him... picked another figure yes. here. Um... Here is the anti-dinosaur person. Here is Rachel, Rachel Reeves. Reeves. Um, as you said, rising star, doing tremendously well, chief secretary. I've heard him make some terrific speeches recently, absolute humdingers of speeches, full of fact and information, uh, and uh, again, very self-confident, much like at the women's conference yesterday, uh, she was terrifically heralded. Incidentally, the women's conference was full of women who were really angry about what was happening locally to care services, to sure starts, to children. And I think this yeah, Labour okay. conference needs to capture some of that anger. Well, let's keep, keep going with the papers. Um, Matthew, you've yes. got a, a, a... Well, I've always, I've always believed that um, mu diary. most of what happens in politics goes completely above the heads of, uh, of most voters. Here's advice, says Atticus Roland White in the, in the Sunday Times. Uh, here's advice for any MP struggling to explain the details of their policy. Labour's Chris Bryant says he met a charming lady with about 35, asked how she might vote. Uh, she replied, that Tony Blair seems to be doing awfully well. What party is he? <laughs> <laughs> I once met a voter on the doorstep, actually not far from here, mm. uh, saying that she was going to vote for that Shirley Williams because she'll stop immigration and bring back hanging. <laughs> <laughs> News to Shirl, I'm sure. Um, you've chosen a non-political story yes. here, Polly. Megan, the, the, the missing, the no longer missing schoolgirl. No, everybody's obviously been absolutely riveted by this, th this story. Um, every parent's nightmare uh, and every head teacher teacher's nightmare too, I should think. The Observer's got a story on its front page saying that the police are saying, for heaven's sake, don't abandon the European arrest warrant. We would never have got her back without it. A hundred Tory MPs have signed, you know, because they sign anything that's against Europe, have signed uh, something saying we want to get rid of the European arrest warrant. Well, it's one of the bits of Europe that really works well, totally common sense, and let's hope they'll all think again. The police are saying... It's essential that I'd, we keep I'd be it. a hopeless magistrate, because I just feel sorry for both of these people. They've just been so silly, and they've got themselves into such a, a mess, and this fairy tale idea of escaping, which was never on the cards. Uh, I, I, can't, I can't get as indignant as I feel sorry, really. Well, I don't know. A 15-year-old uh, with her teacher, who has yes. a huge amount of power well, and of course sway. You're right. It's, you're right. it's, you know, that's just not a, a free... It's not free will. You can't say that at 15. I think it's really bad. We should talk as well about the Church of England, I think, this morning, which is locked in, in something or other, debate. Yes. Argument. Yeah. A secretive panel choosing the Archbishop of Canterbury is rumoured to be deadlocked, and we go through all the runners and riders, and I won't, <laughs> Andrew. And it turns out that one of them is out be because he's anti women, another is out because he's anti gay. Everybody is out because he's pro or anti something. So it strikes me, and here's a prediction, that the Bishop of Welby. Uh, the, the Bishop Welby is, uh, is going to win because nobody knows what his views are on anything. And you I think... heard it here <laughs> first. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Matthew. Um, a bit of American politics, because that, of course, is um, bubbling away very nicely. Lovely picture. Uh, uh, pretty much what uh, Americans seem to be feeling about Romney. My baby screams as, as Romney picks it, uh, as Romney picks up the baby. Romney? What a grand pronunciation, Romney. Polly. Romney. <laughs> Romney. <laughs> Romney. And uh, there we are. It's, it's, it, that, there is a representation of the state of the American voters at the moment because it does seem as if his campaign is going from bad to worse. It's rather nice that his wife... Any politicians go near babies? I can't I mean, think why. Babies are so unpredictable. Works, never, never works. Never works. We did once have a campaign they're running up to politicians and giving them babies and running away saying child care <laughs> child care <laughs> uh, here is his wife Anne Romney saying she's very worried about his mental well-being if he becomes uh, president well, which helpful. seems to me not very helpful really. <laughs> thanks for that wife <laughs> is there time is yes, there, there time is. for the fattest cat in creation this is uh, Fifi the People's Dispensary for Sick Animals, who it's an animal welfare charity, are running a sort of uh, competition, a kind of fat camp for animals uh, uh, to, to try and help particularly fat animals get thinner. Um, Rottweiler Molly now weighs 65 kilograms. That's my weight, incidentally. I was in denial, said her owner, about how big R Molly was. We didn't realise how serious it was until she had problems with her back, back legs. She simply couldn't stand up properly. Sorry, did you, that cat is the same weight as you? No, no, not the cat. No, this is the Rottweiler. Oh, oh the Rottweiler. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I thought 
Oh, no, no. That was your way. You I know here. you're very slight, but that was going a bit no, far. No, 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 there's Cavalier Jack, the, the spaniel, who's 22 kilograms. This is a list of overweight animals, starting with uh, Fifi, the enormous cat. Fifi is, um, what does Fifi weigh? Nine kilograms. Yes, yes. As <laughs> well as the owner of a voraciously greedy cat myself. Charlie, everybody is watching. Um, I, take, <laughs> I take great uh, interest in that. And finally, Cavalier Mar is accused, Cavalier Mar. Cavalier Mar is accused of ignoring Jesus in his BBC History of the World. Have you ignored Jesus? I think sensible Christians who watch the series before they comment will be very, very happy with it, actually. But um, it's, it's... Will I be? I'm president of the British Humanist Association. <laughs> well, you might be slightly less happy at bits of it, Polly, it has to be said. But there's lots of Christians and lots of Christianity, um, as there are lots of other religions. Because in the end, um, religion is an absolutely crucial part of world history. Whatever you think of Wouldn't it now. Wouldn't deny it. Yes. Wouldn't deny it for right. a moment. That was fascinating. Thank you both for now very much indeed.